it's 135, so uh, let's get started. I hope everyone had a nice summer, not able to going out too often. Uh, and welcome back to the new semester. And welcome to the uh, Fundamentals of SEM class. The course code is MSEN614. Uh, we have 17 students enrolled in this class, and we have eight students here, like, you know, in person. That's great. Good to see you guys. It's good to see some new faces as, uh, as well as some familiar faces. The first lecture will be pretty routine, and you may think um, boring. I'll just go through the other syllabus to give you an overview of what we're going to cover in the class, as well as my expectations about you. So I'll start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Tobin Shear. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Material Science and Engineering. I was recruited as a, a microscopy faculty. Uh, this is my email. Many of you have my email already. That's my office phone number. If you call that number, most likely you will not reach me because I'm not in my office. So the best way is, is to contact me via email. Class starts from 135 to 225. So it's a 15 minutes class. My office is in Reed McDonald building, room 247. The lab, uh, if I remember right, it should be from three to six. Usually the labs would not run this long. The reason we have the three hours blocks was before when we had face-to-face -face class as well as face-to-face -face lab. We break the lab up into two sessions. So the first lab goes from three to 4.30. The second lab goes to 4.30 to six. Now, since we have everything online over Zoom, so there's no need for two labs, most likely we'll be able to cover everything in the lab in an hour and a half. So uh, it will be 3 to 4.30. If you have classes after, like, you know, uh, 4.30, uh, there's no clash at all. And the classroom is here, you know, it's in Zachary 160. So this class is about SEM. SEM is probably one of the most widely used characterization techniques available both in research and in industry will cover a number of topics. There's cross-listing. If you take the BIO 604, it will be equivalent to MSEN 614. But in the BIO part, there will more focus on the BIO aspect. For example, how to prepare, like, you know, uh, SEM samples from insects, like from ants, from cockroaches, from, like, you know, leaves. Um, in this course, we focus more on the materials aspect, more like ceramics, metals, and polymers. There are only two credits for this class, but that's why the course load is not very heavy. For the textbook, you don't have to buy it at all. Uh, this is more like a reference. It's the book by David Brendan and Wayne Kaplan. The book is called Microstructural Characterization of Materials. There are only a few chapters on SEM. I think that's a very good summary. If you are interested in characterization of X-ray, SEM, TEM, AFM, like, you know, um, even a little bit of atom probe. If you're interested in having an overall understanding of materials characterization, that's a really nice book. The most important thing is the lecture notes you're going to take in class. Uh, I'll use pen and uh, paper a lot. So please bring something that you can write on, either physical, like, you know, like a piece of paper or like, you know, iPad or Surface Pro. There are also additional SEM books uh, if you are really like a hardcore fan. For SEM. Uh, the first one is by Goldstein. Um, the name of the book is called uh, Scanning Electron Microscopy and X-ray Microanalysis. The second one is by Nan Yao, or Yao Nan, uh, Focus Around Beam System Basics and uh, Applications. These are like, you know, really thick books. You do not need to read them. You only look for relevant information if you encounter specific problems. I will not go through the learning outcomes or course objectives. We'll come back to that when we look at the, uh, the, the weekly uh, schedule, what we plan to cover in the, in the semester. The assessment, assessment and evaluation. Okay, this is pretty standard for any courses. If you get 90 to 100, you get an A. If you get 80 to 89.999999, that's a B. Then 70 to 79.9999, C, so on and so forth. I taught SEM only once, actually. So last year, uh, everyone got A. So I don't want to break the other record. But don't, don't take it too easily. Don't take it too easily. This probably is the, uh, the part you guys are most interested in, how we break down the, uh, the final grades. So um, after the lecture today, uh, in the lab session, we'll, know, we'll not go down to the lab. We'll have the introduction presentations. So it's an individual presentation. I have included that already in the email. 
uh, the dates may be, uh, may be wrong. That was from the, uh, the last semester. For the introduction presentation, it's binary. It's either you get 10 out of 10 or get zero out of 10. As long as you show up, as long as you introduce yourself, uh, you'll get 10 points. The idea is to introduce yourself to your peers. Uh, you're here not to just learn the technical part. Another important part uh, to me, I think, is to know people around you, to make friends. This is more valuable than like deriving certain like you know crazy equation on the on the blackboard. Share with your like you know share share your research, share your life. So to make more friends, that's the idea. The uh, the second part is in class presentation. It will be a group presentation. It, it will be held in most likely the last week of the uh, the, the lab. Uh, I'll revise that uh, and I'll look at the class schedule. So the very last week of the uh, the lecture, I'll still give the lecture but there will be no lab in the last week, similar to the first week. And you guys will form groups to give presentations. Again, I'll talk more about this in details. The third part is the written report. The written report is due on the same day of the group presentation. Both the in-class presentation, like the group presentation, and the individual written report, both are 20%. The last part is final exam. For the final exam is 50%. If you decide not to take final, most likely going to fail the, uh, the class. Okay. So a bit more details for the introduction presentation. You heard about that already. It will happen pretty soon. For the in-class presentation, the, uh, as I said before, the in-class presentation will replace the last week lab. So we'll not go down to the lab or we'll, we'll not Zoom the, uh, the lab. Students will form groups of four. We have 17 students in class. So one group will have like five students. It's the best way to mix and mingle, to, to reach out to, to people and uh, decide on one topic, decide on one topic. The topic needs to be relevant to this class. Usually halfway through the class, you will know what's going to happen in the class. Uh, your presentation, as long as it's about SEM or SEM related technique, it is okay. The topic to be more specific, it can be either from your own research for example, if you use SEM to do something, it solved a big problem and you end up having a paper, you can present that or you can just read into literature to see what are the new techniques available about SEM. So it's your choice. The duration of the presentation is 20 minutes. What I want to do is to mimic what's going to happen in the, uh, in the conference presentation. In conference, you usually have 15 to 20 minutes followed by five minutes Q&A. So let's do that uh, in this way kind of like give you guys uh, an, an opportunity to practice. And also uh, each student in the same team will receive the same score. If your team gets nine out of 10, everyone in the team will get nine out of 10. Please do not come to me saying there's one student who did nothing and that person does not deserve like nine, that person should get eight and uh, or even seven, uh, everyone else should, should get 10. In the future, when you go out in the workforce, uh, you, you will work in the team. You, you will work with different types of people. So how to make a team work, I think that's also important. It's impossible, like, you know, someone working with you will be someone you get along, like, you know, really well. But if everyone likes each other in the same team, that's great. But if there are differences, embrace the differences and prepare yourself for the, uh, for the future. The in-class presentation will be done via Zoom. So the next part is the written report. It's also 20%. The, uh, the written report is due the last week in class. So uh, you can either hand in the physical copy, you can print the, uh, the report out, or, or you can email me, either will do. Uh, each student will pick a topic that is relevant to this class. It's really your call. You can write something about uh, your group presentation, or you can pick something like, you know, not relevant to the group presentation. It's really your call. Use your imagination, go wild, think about something you like to do. Then the last part is no more than two pages, excluding references. So the, the report should not be longer than two pages for a couple of reasons. I don't know whether you guys heard about like elevator speech. You only have a short time with someone really important in the elevator. In one minute or in two minutes, you need to convince that person to either fund your idea or give you money to do something great. To condense something in two pages will help you practice the ability to write something concisely. The references are not included in the two pages. If you want my feedback, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. 
the last year, the SEM class, as well as the TM class, uh, I did the written report. A number of students, they reached out to me after submitting the report. What I do is I usually go through one paragraph in details to tell you what I think, how it can be further improved. Any questions about the written report? Figures are included, yeah. Another reason is because some of you may want to become a faculty. In most of the cases, you submit like a white paper to the program manager before you submit the full proposal. The white paper usually is two pages. It will be a good opportunity for you to practice that as well. So in two pages, you need to convince the program manager, say, it's a good idea. It's worth spending the time to develop the full proposal. The last part is the final exam is compulsory, uh, it's 50%. This year, it may, it may be open book because uh, many of you will take, the class, uh, will take the final exam, not in class, but at home. So uh, I'll make that open book. The duration is two hours. What's gonna happen is whoever's in class, I'll collect all the papers in two hours. For people who are online, uh, what I'm going to do is I'll send out the email when we start the exam here and uh, they have to submit the, uh, the final paper by the end of two hours. The final exam is graded on the zero to 100 points scale. One thing I like to do with the graduate students, not with the undergrad students, is usually I ask questions from you guys. Uh, if each one of you gives me one question, I'll rephrase it, I'll change a few things, then I'll put them in the final exam. If I do not receive any questions from you, I have a bank of questions I can ask you. So I'll leave it to you guys. If you want to contribute, feel free to email me one question for the final. If not, it is okay too. For the final exam, the aim is not to test you. The aim is to make sure you understand what you learned in class. When you make up the question in the exam, that actually challenges you. Like, you know, what if you are the instructor, what kind of questions you're gonna ask? So I think that's a better way to learn. But if you decide not to provide any questions, it's okay too. Attendance uh, is zero percent. You guys are graduate students, way over 21. If our guys are old enough to drink, then you guys are old enough to take responsibility for your own education and the life. My expectations for you, it's not like, you know, like a hard expectation. Uh, it's more like the advice. The first is work hard. I don't have to say too much about it. Then um, if possible, come to the, uh, the lectures uh, prepared, like participate and ask questions. To me, like, you know, to learn the most is to actually ask questions during class. If there's anything that uh, you do not understand, please feel free to interrupt me during the class. Most likely the question you ask is something many other people don't understand. So please don't be shy. Then proactively participate in the lab sessions. If there's something in the lab I'm doing that does not make sense, stop me. Like, you know, just tell me, like, you know, can you go back one step? Uh, tell, tell us more about it, like why do you do this, why do you turn that knob, why do you like, you know, go to that specific area to do imaging. The fourth thing is ask for help from instructor, which is me. Technicians, if you learn SEM uh, from um, the technicians uh, or your classmates, whenever there are concepts not clear, do not let something you don't understand through, because um, in the, especially in the first few weeks, if there are things you don't understand, it may affect your understanding towards the, the later lectures. Number five is to apply what you have learned in class to your research. This is actually the best way to learn SEM. If you are able to go to the lab to use SEM for your research, try it, try something you have learned in class, then you will learn that for sure. And the knowledge will be engraved in your brain. The last thing I say that to all the students is something I hope to see. That's something I call students to scholars uh, what is a student? A student asks, is that going to be in the final exam? That's a typical question from a student. What is a scholar? A scholar asks, what should I do if I want to learn more about it? So that's something I really hope to see uh, in you guys, especially at the end of PhD or at the end of undergrad. Okay, so that's pretty much the, uh, the, the syllabus. Let's move on. Uh, this is the week by week kind of uh, schedule. You don't have to write that down. I'll give you like a big picture of what's gonna happen in the entire class. It looks like a lot of information. You don't have to worry about it. And uh, one more thing, this is very uh, important and I highlighted via the note. 
uh, what I wrote is successfully completing the class does not entitle you the checked uh, check out status at the MIC, MCF or ADIFAB instruments. What the class aims to do is to provide you a basic or good understanding how SEM works and how to get the information you're looking for. How to operate the instrument is not the purpose of this class. Technicians at MIC, MCF and ADIFAB, they will train you, you know, after being checked out, then you can use the instrument. Let me give you like a big picture of what we're gonna cover in class. So let's do like um, in the first week, let's do the course outline. Uh, in SEM, there are only three parts you have to worry about. The first part is called instrumentation and optics. We'll talk about different components of SEM. We'll also talk about how the beam travels in the microscope. We'll talk about how you can get nice images, how you can correct, like, uh, for example, astigmatism and other, other unwanted effects in SEM. So this is the first big chunk. The second big chunk of the, uh, the class, it's simply beam material or electron beam material interaction. So E-beam. When you have electrons hitting a specimen, hitting a material, tons of signals will be generated. So what are the signals we can generate? And what signals to use to extract specific information? Um, for example, if I have like, you know, a, a ping pong ball throwing at the brick wall, the ping pong balls will bounce back. So that's one kind of signal. If, if the, the ping pong balls are of super high energy and are super strong, then while I'm hitting the wall, the bits of pieces from the wall will come out. That's another type of information. So what information we can generate through the electron beam material interaction, it will be the second big chunk of the, uh, the class. For the third chunk, I call SEM related techniques. In many of the cases, like uh, what you use is not really SEM. For example, you use focus ion beam. The working principle of focus ion beam and SEM, they're nearly the same. Um, a lot of things we learned from SEM can be applied to focus ion beam. Also, for helium ion microscopy, it's another technique. Uh, some of you does polymer research, is that correct? Helium ion microscopy will have some advantages compared to regular SEM if you work on polymer nanowires, for example. Uh, also, there's environmental SEM. If you work on something like, you know, non-conductive, by doing environmental SEM, you'll be able to mitigate the, the charging effect. So all of these things, they are not really like, you know, um, the classical SEM, but they are related to SEM. So this is like the entire course in the big picture. That's something not only for the SEM class, you can do to any class. If you can group the knowledge into chunks, it will be easy for you to follow and digest. So let's go to the, uh, the more technical part of today's class. Let's just say forming images. That's kind of like step outside the, uh, the box. SEM, we are using electrons to form images but electron is not the only source we can use to generate images. There are other things we can use to generate pictures or images. So I'll write down electrons first. Any other methods or any other sources you can generate um, images. By the way, I usually bring a uh, tic tac to class to uh, <laughs> reward students. Not only work well for undergrad students, it works well for uh, grad students too. 
So besides electrons, any other sources, any other ways you can form images? Uh, pardon? Acoustic imaging. Very good. Uh, I heard someone saying something over, over Zoom. Photons. Photons, very good. Too bad I cannot give you the, uh, the chocolate. Okay. Uh, light is photon. So, yeah, uh, actually for photons, let me break that down into two things. Uh, you're, you're right, when you say light, um, it's more like visible light. So very good. So visible light. Of course, give out chocolates. Any preference? Well, I have regular Tic Tac, uh, dark chocolate and white chocolate. Dark chocolate. Dark chocolate. Okay. Oh, by the way, there's no eating in class, so uh, you have to hold off your temptation. Regular white chocolate or regular? Okay. Here you go. <laughs> oh, it's dark chocolate. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Well, any, any other sources you can use to see something. Uh, think about it, like, you know, you go to see a dentist or like you have a bone fracture or you go to the airport, what do you use? X-ray. X-ray, yeah, very good, very good. So X-ray is also a photon. Here you go. So what's the, the main difference between X-ray and the visible light? Energy, energy very good. Uh, to be more specific, what controls or what determines the energy of the, the photon? Wavelength, very good, or frequency. So which one has smaller wavelength? X-ray. X-ray, yes, yes. So this is large wavelength. And X-ray has small wavelength. Okay. Um, In infrared should probably be on the two, right? Can you say that again? I didn't hear you clearly. Infrared. Infrared. Yes, infrared. That's correct. Infrared. Uh, it's not visible. So uh, I'll write it down here. So. I think my spelling is correct. So infrared is also one type of photon. Uh, anyone from nuclear engineering? No one from nuclear? Okay, so if, uh, it's fine. Like you can also use neutron to get information. So another one is neutron. Now let's look at the uh, advantages and the disadvantages of each type of source. Um, for infrared, which I'm not very familiar with, I'll skip it. <laughs> let's go to the visible light. What is the advantage or what are the advantages? What are the disadvantages? Easy, simple, yeah. All you have to do is turn on the switch like, you know, here comes light, or you go out and uh, bathe in the sun. So that's pretty easy. Um, inexpensive. Usually. inexpensive. Good, good, good. Yeah, inexpensive. And, uh, sorry, what did you say? Uh, did you say something? Okay, no side effect, or does, uh, let's say small side effect. Uh, in fact, there will be like some side effects. I'll tell you, uh, I'll talk about it like very shortly. So less, let's say less sample damage. It's also safe. Okay, uh, less sample damage is similar to safe um, because it doesn't damage uh, uh, what you're looking at too badly. So yes, so it's relatively safe as well. For example, if, if you have like a piece of metal, you put it in the, in the sunlight uh, over 100 years, 1000 years, it does not change. 
So for some samples, uh, light does not damage too badly. However, for polymers, for polymers, there's like, you know, photon leaching kind of thing. Photons can actually break chem uh, chemical bonds in the polymers. If you have a piece of plastic, you leave it outside for like, you know, a month, then um, it will lose its mechanical integrity. It will just break down by the light. And also for cell work, especially for like, you know, uh, fluorescent microscopy, if you expose the cell samples or in the light for a long time, it will damage cells as well. But it's not too bad. Like, you know, it's not like you turn on the lights, all the, all the cells, they die. It's not like the case. So uh, those are the advantages of visible light. What are the uh, disadvantages or what is the main disadvantage? Low resolution. Due to the... Wavelength. Long wavelengths, yes. So uh, low resolution. For green light, let's just pick a random light. For green light, the wavelength is 400 nanometers. So green light, the wavelength is about 400 nanometers. You cannot use something 400 nanometers to resolve something one nanometer or 20 nanometers or 100 nanometers because of something you learned back in high school physics. Because of Um, for example, I have a feature, like, you know, 20 nanometers in size, and I use, like, a, uh, I use light 400 nanometers in wavelengths. Why I cannot use the 400 nanometers wavelength light to resolve, to see the 20 nanometer nanoparticle? Diffraction, very good, very good. If you have samples comparable to the, uh, to the wavelength of the, the light, or, like, smaller, then diffraction will happen. You will not be able to resolve which one to see. Uh, many things are less than 400 nanometers. One major disadvantage of visible light is the low resolution. There's one more advantage I've got to mention. It's easy to focus for visible light. All you have to do is to use the glass lens. You put a few lenses together, you have a microscope. So you don't need like expensive instruments to focus the, uh, uh, the light. Another advantage, they don't need vacuum. No need for vacuum. It's a money saver. Just imagine like, you know, if you have to operate in vacuum, it will be very expensive. If you can just pull out microscope, star imaging, it's super easy and uh, it's, it's handy to use. So this is about the optical microscope or the using visible light. How about X-ray? What are the advantages? What are the disadvantages? Penetration. Penetration, yeah, good penetration. So. Any other advantages or disadvantages? Small wavelength. Yeah, yeah. So theoretically, it has better resolving power than visible light. Just a small lambda. Any other advantages, disadvantages? For, for bio specimens like human beings, you don't want yourself to be exposed at, uh, to, to x-ray all the time. So, good for living samples. But uh, in material science class, since we are working with like, you know, non-living things, so it's not a major problem. Any other advantages or disadvantages of using x-ray? Expensive. Expensive, yes. For light microscope, like um, all of us can afford one, like, you know, a simple optical microscope. On Amazon, maybe 60 bucks, you can buy one. 
at rate, I don't think they sell it on Amazon. So you can see the other difference. And also, uh, how, how to generate X-ray, actually, let me ask you. Anyone knows how to generate X-ray? Um, high voltage X-ray tube that throws electrons off, or you know, throws photons off of the filler that's highly charged, right? Very good, very good. So in most of the cases, uh, we work with the copper target. So there's a vacuum tube on one side, that's the, uh, the electron gun. On the other side, that's the, uh, the copper target. The high energy electron will bombard the, uh, the copper target and that gives off X-ray. So that's why like, it's, it's expensive. It's very energy consuming. Uh, what, what are other disadvantages of X-ray? I'm looking for one more. To focus on X-ray. Very good, so difficult to focus. Unlike visible light, you can just use a glass lens to bend the, the light. X-ray, because it's so good at penetrating materials, it's nearly impossible, I'm saying nearly impossible to focus X-ray. It's just very difficult. Okay, let's move to neutron. Advantages, disadvantages, any ideas? Neutron, the first thing is very expensive to produce, a lot more expensive than X-ray, very expensive. because you need something radioactive to give off neutron. The second problem, oh, I should have written the advantages first. Okay, anyway, should be okay. The second disadvantage is usually after neutron uh, irradiation, the sample becomes radioactive itself. If you do that over a long time, it's kind of you throw a professor in, comes out a hawk. So that's the other idea. The, in terms of advantage, the neutron. So the main advantage of neutron is because it's a particle. Anything is wave and a particle. If it's a particle, the wavelength is super small. So it has very low wavelengths, very small, sorry, very, very small wavelengths. Okay. Finally, to electrons. What are the advantages of using electrons? That will be the main focus of this class. Short wavelengths. Can you say that again? Short wavelengths. Very good, very good. So short wavelengths. And it's easy to focus. Yes, easy to focus. The reason electrons are easy to focus is because electrons the charge. are charged particles, exactly. So we can use electromagnetic lenses to focus electrons. Unlike neutrons and X-ray, it's very difficult to focus. What are the um, disadvantages of using electrons compared to, for example, photons and neutrons? They can... They can... <laughs> they can... A vacuum, okay, very good. So th there were two things mentioned by the students. The first is vacuum, that requires a good vacuum. Because if we have air particles in the column or in the, uh, like, you know, in the way of electrons, electrons can get scattered. So that's why we need good vacuum for electrons. And also, uh, sorry, what was the other second one? Okay, yeah, so, very good. So, need conductive samples. For the conductivity of samples, if you work uh, in metals, you're lucky, because metals are conductors. You don't have to do anything to the samples before you put them in the SEM. If you work on semiconductors, it's okay too, but if you work on like super insulator, like, you know, insulative uh, ceramics, like glass, uh, just regular glass, window pane glass. If you work on polymers, then you need to find a way to make samples conducting before putting that in the SEM. Otherwise, it will be charging like crazy. We'll talk about it towards the end of the class, like how to mitigate charging, what causes charging, 
and uh, what is the best way to minimize charging without altering microstructure uh, too much. So for acoustics, uh, I'm not an expert in acoustics, so I will not comment um, on that. So this is like a big picture. When you do something like, you know, especially in grad school, it's very specific, always step outside, think about how what we learn can fit into a bigger picture. Is electron the only thing we can use? Is there any other better ways we can characterize the material? And if you use electron as the source, what are the advantages? What are the unique information you can extract? I have a few slides to share before we finish today's class. So this is the first class introduction to uh, this course. There are two things uh, I mentioned already. The first is it seems everyone is okay with recording the lecture and the labs for the, uh, the students. Talking about SEM, um, there are three major user facilities you can use the instruments. The first one is IPFAB. The second place you can do SEM is the Microscopy Imaging Center, MIC. The third place you can do uh, SEM, uh, Materials Characterization Facility. Okay, something related to the class, but not too much uh, about SEM. Anyone knows who drew the, uh, the picture? This is called Vitruvian Man. Da Vinci, very good, very good. So the picture tells us it's the length of the L spread arms is equal to the height of the man. From the hairline to the bottom of the chin is one tenth of the height of the man, so on and so forth. So what this tells us is human beings are obsessed to do measurement, to measure things. For things we can see using visible light, we can just see using our naked eyes, we can use a ruler to do measurements. But how about small things we cannot see using naked eyes? Then we need to go to microscope. What we do in SEM, one thing, one thing we like to do at EM is to quantify, is to do measurements. For example, to measure the size of the nanoparticles, to measure the size of the grains. Later on, you will learn the, the, like using SEM, you can do chemical analysis, how much element A, how much element B you have in the material. So quantification is the key for any scientific research. And it traces all the way back to 1490. What else do I have? Okay, I have one more slide on the, on the poem. Anyone knows this poem or part of this poem? To see a world in the grain of sand and a heaven in a wildflower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. The poem is by William Blake. Let's not worry about the, uh, the second part. To see a world in the grain of sand and a heaven in a wildflower. This is some crazy ideas from some great poem, but using SEM, I'll show you, you really can see a world in the grain of sand and you can see heaven in the petal of a flower. You'll see something amazing. Before finishing today's class, I have a video to play. Um, that's it for today's class. I'll see everyone in about half an hour on Zoom for the self-introduction. <laughs>